Good morning. I'm Kim Malley, the Senior Retail Insight Manager here at AHDB, and welcome to our first set of 2021 webinars by the Retail and Consumer Insight team. If you're new to what we do as a team, we're here to provide independent, impartial market analysis and insights to support levy payers and others in the industry uh, to better understand their market and make more informed business decisions. We do this through regular reporting on our website, through meetings, conferences, etc., looking at retail and food service consumption trends and tracking consumer attitudes and behaviour. Today's webinar is focusing on the changing market landscape for meat as we start to get back to some sort of normality following the COVID-19 pandemic. We'll be taking you through how meat purchasing and consumption has evolved and shifted across retail and food service as the market starts to reopen, and most importantly, pulling out key opportunities and threats for the category. Um, but before I start that, um, there's a few housekeeping points to go through. We will aim to finish before the hour with the agenda being about 40 minutes from us and then there'll be about 15 minutes for Q&A's at the end. All participants are currently on mute, um, but questions can be asked by typing them in the questions box, which you should be able to see on the right hand side. If you don't, um, you'll see a, an orange arrow. So if you expand that, the taskbar will open and there'll be a white arrow next to the word questions, which you can click, um, which will open up and allow you to type them in. The session is being recorded and therefore will be hosted on our website um, afterwards in case you want to play anything back or pass on the recording to any colleagues. Um, the presentation slides will be available for all participants after the session once a quick two minute feedback survey is completed. So it's really important to fill this in at the end, otherwise you won't be able to get the presentation slides. And lastly, if you're on any social media platforms, please feel free to post about this session um, and make sure you tag us at hashtag AHGB Insight as you can see on the slide. Um, we are, this is the first of our webinars and I'll be touching on the others that are available over the next few weeks at the end. Um, but now would be a good point to introduce our speakers for today. So we have um, Rebecca Gladman, who is the Retail Insight Manager in the team, and Rachel Rose, who is the Consumer Insight Analyst. Um, they're going to be a bit of a double act and we'll spend about 30 minutes taking you through um, how the meat market is looking. Then this will lead nicely into the Q&A session, which I will host at the end. So please get your questions coming through during the session. So without further ado, I'll hand it over to Rebecca Gladman. Great morning, everyone. And thanks, Kim, for that introduction. Um, obviously, this time last year when we did the webinars, we were talking about how much more we're all at home. And, and really, a year on, not a lot has changed. Things have started to open up a little bit in the out-of-home market, but really we are all still at home a lot more than we were pre-pandemic. And this chart here just illustrates this. So what we've got in the blue line here is the number of consumption occasions that we've had eaten at home. And in that orange line there, the number that we've eaten out. And we can obviously see that food service has taken a big hit um, linked to a lot of the, the lockdowns, obviously restrictions still, um, and a bit of consumer unease as well. So what this means is that our in-home meal occasions are actually up around sort of half a billion per month um, compared to pre-pandemic. So we're still seeing a lot coming through the retail grocery market. So when I take you through now some of the grocery figures, obviously bear this in mind that we are all still at home a lot more and this is boosting sales figures still. So obviously for a major category like meat, fish and poultry, we're seeing this uplift linked to some of those increase in uh, meal occasions. So versus 2019, total meat, fish and poultry volumes are up 3%. Uh, we obviously see a drop back versus last year because we're not at home as much as we once were um, and this is affecting those grocery figures. However, for meat, fish and poultry or MFP, as you might hear me refer to it as, um, this does compare to a 6% volume growth for total food and drink, um, excluding alcohol. So it does mean that actually we're slightly losing share as a category versus the total grocery market. So something in particular that may have boosted this, we looked at this chart last year, um, actually is that the media noise around red meat has dropped right back. And just to flag that this data goes up to August and it does exclude some of the, the more recent um, headlines that we've seen, particularly around pig crisis, meat consumption, research, et cetera. 
So what we saw at the start of the pandemic was that that median noise around red meat dropped back right down to around 19% from its pre-pandemic peak of around a third of consumers. And it's actually stayed at that very low level since, been very stable. So this could potentially be helping um, the, the current um, sales figures for uh, meat, fish and poultry in the grocery market. Um, but like I mentioned, this data is sort of before a lot of the recent headlines. And so we do expect more media noise to be picking up around uh, red meat in the coming waves of our consumer tracker. And when it comes to the tone of what people are hearing, what we ask is whether or not they've sort of heard more negative perceptions or more um, positive uh, information on red meat. And what we saw sort of towards the end of 2020, beginning of 21, was actually a lot more positivity going on. Um, and what, unfortunately, what we've seen in the latest wave of the tracker is that this has dropped back. That sort of positive sentiment is now lower than the negative sentiment. And potentially this could impact um, volumes in the market going forward. We've already seen sort of people start to drop out and therefore this could be further exacerbated as we move on and into further months. And I mentioned that some of those shoppers have started to drop out and we can see here some of the figures of household penetration, which is the proportion of households buying into these categories uh, in Great Britain. And we have here primary beef, pork and lamb. And you can see here that pre-pandemic, uh, around 70% of consumers buy into beef, half buy into primary pork and 30% uh, primary lamb. And for all of these proteins, we saw a big increase during the pandemic peak. So more shoppers coming back in, buying uh, these proteins from their supermarkets, from their butchers, from their independents, etc. However, in the most recent data, we have seen this drop right back, um, even below pre-pandemic levels. So this is a real risk for, for volumes going forward. And actually at the same time, we do see that meat-free has continued on its growth tra trajectory, um, even seeing a little bit of switching from these primary proteins back into meat-free. Um, and therefore, we do know that this is obviously a bit of a risk for meat, fish and poultry overall, particularly red meat. And we'll come back later on in the presentation to some figures on meat free. So with that overall change in sales in the grocery market, there's obviously some key winners and losers. And online is the key one to call out here. And obviously, at the start of the pandemic, we know that everyone was clambering for a a delivery slot, um, a lot of the websites were crashing, a lot of waiting times. Um, and so therefore, versus uh, 2019, online meat, fish and poultry sales are up 70% versus that year. But we have seen a bit of a readjustment versus 2020 with volumes down around 4%. So um, some, some shoppers sort of not buying as much as they once were or some shoppers moving out of the category. And one of uh, the key areas for this is our family groups who have started to sort of shop around a little bit more, um, but they are sort of key to retain and re-engage because they are definitely more loyal when shopping online. Um, and they also have bigger basket spends. They put more basically in their online uh, shopping trolleys than they do going into a physical store. So really important to re-engage them. And omni-channel offers, so those offers that perhaps they, they get, they could use in a supermarket or online or they receive in a supermarket to use online, could definitely be a uh, benefit to retain or re-engage these shoppers. Our butchers were really interesting trend last year during the peak of the pandemic. Uh, we saw a massive increase in sales. And during the summer of 2020, we had around 200,000 extra shoppers at butcher shops versus 2019. Unfortunately, we've seen all these shoppers drop back out now, and we see that actually versus 2019, butchers volumes of uh, meat and poultry are down 4%. So we haven't managed to retain um, a lot of the shoppers or uh, the volumes coming through there. Uh, we do know that coming into Christmas, obviously it's not far off now, that we see an increase in shoppers during the Christmas period at butchers. Um, so actually incentivizing them during Christmas, perhaps maybe to come back during January, February, get a small discount, get a small something extra, might incentivise them to, to become slightly more loyal than they are as just their, their perhaps once a year purchase at Christmas. And then supermarkets and discounters are key areas sort of that, that readjustment um, of, of uh, meat and poultry sales. We see that supermarket sales still sort of need to um, recover some of the losses from a couple of years ago, but actually the discounters versus two years ago gaining around 3%. And what was interesting particularly with the discounters was that 
um, we did see their growth really stagnate at a total grocery level during the uh, peak of the pandemic. But actually, um, all of the forecasts now are for them to continue doing particularly well. Um, obviously, um, supermarkets now are talking a lot more about price communications. So we have the Tesco Club Card offers, Sainsbury's doing their Aldi price match, for example. But this is really a heartland for um, the discounters. And therefore, as a lot of people start to feel financially um, vulnerable, this could benefit this channel in particular, which is leading to some of those forecasts. And Rachel will illustrate some of those consumer sentiments now. Hello. Um, so since the pandemic, many consumers have felt the economic pinch. And we can see that by 28% are claiming that their household finances have been negatively impacted. Um, and in order to save money, the top three things consumers are looking to do since the pandemic is buy products on promotion, switch from branded to own label products and shop at cheaper stores. So looking forward, financial confidence varies. But what we can see on the left hand side in the charting is quite clearly in September of 2021, all consumers felt less confident about their finances. And so it's really important to understand reliance of categories on these demographics, as we could see some categories benefit from this change to spending power. For instance, convenient ready to cook items and meal deals, which over index with the class AB shopper. But it's important to note that any cutback in household spending is likely to be directed to out of home spending. Therefore, volumes are likely to move from out of home to the in home occasion. Even those on higher incomes who have saved money during the pandemic could be affected by increasing costs such as gas and tax. For those on lower incomes who are more likely to buy burgers and frozen meat items, it's important that these are available at low outlay price points. So instead of using your two for X or three for X deals, which require more to be spent at once, we should be utilizing uh, round pound price points. And additionally, advice on how to freeze meals, leftovers or cuts could also be beneficial to consumers who are trying to save money. And so alongside financial concern, 34% are still claiming to eat out less when compared to pre-pandemic. And the most claimed reasons behind not eating out as often are just generally staying in more, trying to save money and concerns over cleanliness. But what could this mean for meat? Well, for those who are eating out less, they may look to replicate out of home meals in home with premium and added value cuts. And a good example of this would be consumers treating themselves to steak throughout the pandemic. Additionally, with more people staying at home, there may be more entertaining and socialising with friends and family. And this may impact seasonal events or parties and drive consumption of larger joints of meat. So looking at food service now, what we've seen is that with COVID restrictions eased, shoppers have returned to food service. However, at a total level, food service is only 80% of what it was in the same time frame of 2019. But what we can see quite clearly is that quick service restaurants are performing better than they were two years ago, whereas full service restaurants and pubs and bars where consumers are likely to spend more on meat are still down on pre-pandemic levels. And when I say spend more on meat, I'm referring to people treating themselves to the premium cuts when they're out and about. So what we've got on this chart here is the faint uh, lines which represent the 2019 average of each category. And then we've got the bold squiggly lines um, which show the actual consumption occasions. So what we can see is that takeaways in the blue color on the chart um, are the only area to see growth in consumption occasion, whereas eat in and on the go, the two shades of green are still down significantly compared to pre-pandemic. 
And this is mainly down to lockdown restrictions as restaurants and pubs were closed and consumers worked from home where possible, which significantly reduced footfall. But additionally, since reopening, restaurants and pubs have been open, but with a reduced capacity. And as I highlighted earlier, less people are actually uh, going out as frequently. But what we can see is that obviously takeaways were more geared for food delivery, so benefited significantly. And factors I've previously just mentioned, such as economic pressure, working from home rates and cleanliness over uh, concerns over cleanliness are still impacting the number of eating and on the go occasions. But we can see that both eating and on the go are starting to recover. So what we've done there is talk, sort of take you through a scene set there of uh, the overall market for grocery, but also meat, fish and poultry, looking at both of the retail grocery and food service um, trends there and a lot of the consumer sentiment behind it. So what we want to do now is look at how both of those areas, the retail and food service, actually balance out and focus in on beef, lamb and pork. So firstly, just to look back at total food and non-alcoholic drinks and how these are balancing, um, actually what we see is that versus 2020, we are seeing a big increase in volumes so that's sort of measured in overall packs and items, around 8% versus 2020 in the past six months. And this is very much linked to that food service recovery. However, versus 2019, we're actually seeing very flat volumes and therefore we are basically buying and ordering as much as we were two years ago and um, no big increases there. So it's something to bear in mind when we look at beef, lamb and pork. So looking at pork to start with, um, just to talk you through this chart first, actually what we do at AHDB is that we take a uh, Kantar out of home panel data and we apply our own volume estimates to all of the dishes that the panelists can record in that data. Uh, and to produce our own volume estimates for uh, pork, beef and lamb. Uh, so this information isn't available anywhere else. These are estimates that we do in-house. And this allows us to get an estimate of the, the balance between retail and food service for each of these proteins. And what we can see here is that for pork, we are um, estimating an overall net change and net increase of 2% versus 2020 on the right. And then also this we expect to be up 3% versus 2019. So that net gain versus 2020 of around 2% equates to just over an additional 9,000 tonnes of uh, pork and pig meat. So um, obviously, whilst we are um, seeing small increases in percentages, obviously um, not in significant volumes. So looking first at the retail trend, actually, what we've seen driving this overall is definitely our processed products and particularly sausages and bacon um, have been a real driver. So whilst we see that these categories are in um, pretty decent losses versus 2020, this is just because 2020 was such an anomaly and particularly for these categories because they grew much faster than the overall grocery market average. And actually versus 2019, we're still seeing volumes for sausages up 4% and bacon up 5%. So really decent increases in volume there. Uh, I think the pandemic has really just shown what sort of household staples these products are. So uh, for sausages, the main meal is still sausages and mash. But actually for bacon, there's a lot around sort of the breakfast occasion, unsurprisingly, um, but also bacon rolls consumed throughout the day. And actually in the past year, there's been an extra 70 million um, consumption occasions of uh, bacon sarnies uh, over the past year versus 2020. So a big increases still coming through. So that's the processed influence on the market. Actually, when we look at primary pork, there are some differing trends by cuts. And one in, um, in particular to mention is pork chops, which are seeing a decline versus 2020, um, but also versus 2019. So some volumes to recoup there. And actually, the evening occasion is still uh, the main occasion for primary proteins and pork in particular. Uh, and so actually diversifying into other meals, particularly as the pandemic has generated this legacy of more uh, volumes and occasions going through the breakfast occasion and also lunch means that we need to diversify a little bit. We're still very reliant on particularly roast dinners. 
So um, getting pork use in leftovers, for example, I think Rachel illustrated that well with talking about sort of the lower income households, use of leftovers, freezing would also play in really well to that. And also coming through the Kantar data is uh, things around an increase in um, mills chosen as easy to clear up or quick to clear up and therefore inspiring sort of really easy uh, meal occasions, perhaps tray bakes, for example, or stews and casseroles as we move into the winter could work particularly well and obviously playing really well with pork chops um, as a cut there. In the food service market, we see three key dishes for pork and pig meat. And these are firstly savoury pastries, which include sausage rolls, which have about 30% of overall pork food service volumes that we estimate. Um, and then we have our sandwiches, which includes you know, ham, bacon, sausage, sarnies, for example, and then breakfast as well. So these take the lion's share of overall food service volumes that we estimate. And these have been performing uh, relatively well during the pandemic. Um, particularly, we're seeing the influence of takeaways coming through here. So what we've seen for sandwiches in this line here is that we have seen a relatively sort of steady increase in volumes um, since the start of the pandemic. Um, we obviously see a, a drop off during the winter when we had a second lockdown or a major extended lockdown there. Um, but generally following a growth trajectory, still some way to go to get back to pre-pandemic levels, which is very typical across all of the dishes and proteins that we'll look at. Savoury pastry is really interesting because actually we didn't see as much as a dip off in the, in the winter lockdown. Um, and this is because there was still a lot coming through some of those takeaways, both collected and delivery, and not just through um, national chains like Greg's, but also the independents um, really doing well with this dish. One area that really sort of needs to recoup some of those losses is around the cooked breakfast. So we obviously see that this is a lot more vulnerable to the closures to the dining environment and um, doesn't work as well for the takeaway delivery um, market. And therefore those losses in the winter, in particular the start of this year, are much more significant than those other two dishes. And therefore this is really what's holding back pork in uh, the food service market at the moment. So. Those dishes there are obviously perhaps more processed products. Um, what we see is actually still an opportunity for pork scented meals. So these are dishes like your roast dinners, for example, something that's centered around the meat um, rather than sort of perhaps more processed. And therefore um, these dishes take around 10% of total pork food service uh, volume. And actually they are um, contributing only about 8% of growth at the moment. So there's still a bit of an opportunity gap there. And what we see when we look at the data by channels is actually our pubs and bars account for around half of these meals. And then if we split that further, it's roughly equal between chains and independents. And what Rachel showed earlier is that pubs and bars in particular are one area that still needs to get back up to where it, uh, where it was pre-pandemic, so only around 80% of what it was before. And therefore working hand in hand, supplier and operator will be really, really important as both to benefit their sales, but also drive pork volumes in the out of home market. Thanks, Beck. So yeah, I'm going to take us through beef and lamb. So firstly, looking at beef, from our estimates, we believe that beef volumes have actually declined by 2% versus 2020. And this equates to 7,257 tonnes less beef meat. Um, and what we can see is that throughout the on the charting, throughout the year, Sales have generally been driven by retail, but in the last 24 weeks, food service has started to gain volume and retail has declined slightly. And when we compare back to 2019, the volume sales of beef have been sustained. Um, however, 2021 obviously declines on 2020 as 2020 was such an exceptional year for food um, sales in general. So now looking at beef in retail, primary cuts make up the biggest share of beef volume sales at 45%. But in the 12 weeks ending the 5th of September 2021 versus the same time frame in 2019 and 2020, we can see that beef retail sales on the whole have declined. 
with mints and burgers and grills seeing the largest declines. And sales of mints throughout 2021 versus 2020 have declined quite significantly as mints again had a really exceptional year in 2020 throughout the pandemic as consumers were looking to batch cook and freeze as much as possible to avoid shopping as regularly. So now in terms of food service, again, we're going to highlight the top three performing dishes, which are burgers, savoury pastries and steaks. And so where retail sales have actually declined in terms of burgers, food service have managed to pick back up. But the volume of beef burgers is being driven by quick service restaurants with year on year growth of 24.5 percent whereas volumes of burgers in full service restaurants and pubs are actually in decline. And on the right hand side, we can see how these dishes have performed over time. Um, so what we've seen is that steak is currently accounting for 9% of food service beef volumes, but comparing back to pre pandemic, steak actually accounted for 14% of volumes. And so to get steak back to the pre-pandemic level, we can see that there's the opportunity to use targeted promotions. As steak sales actually spiked during the Eat Out to Help Out scheme, which is uh, highlighted in the blue bar on the charting. And obviously this stimulated consumer demand for the dish. So now looking at lamb, our estimates suggest lamb volume sales are largely similar when compared back to 2020. And we can see again that lamb sales have primarily been driven by retail sales, but in the last 24 weeks, lamb sold through food service has gained on the previous year. And when we compare this back to 2019, we estimate that lamb volumes have increased by roughly 2%, which accounts for an additional 840 tonnes of lamb meat. So in terms of retail, lamb volumes again are driven by primary cuts, accounting for 65% of all retail volume. But we can see on the right hand side that leg and shoulder roasting joints as well as lamb chops have seen the greatest decline in volumes. However, with lockdown restrictions removed and more social and family gatherings, shoulder and leg joints will hopefully gain throughout the next year um, with no restrictions, uh, particularly at Easter time. And then when it comes to food service, the top three performing dishes for lamb are kebabs, curries and lamb scented main meals. With kebabs in particular benefiting from takeaway orders throughout the pandemic, with volumes up 13% in the year ending the 5th of September 2021. However, we understand that a lot of lamb kebab meat isn't of British origin, so it's not an 100% positive picture. But looking over time on the right hand side, we can see that again, lamb centred um, meals spiked in the Eat Out to Help Out scheme, whereas kebabs actually declined as takeaways weren't incentivised within the scheme. So this suggests there's actually an opportunity to sell more lamb on promotion, as we see that the lamb centred meals grew when incentivised on a limited menu basis. Great, so what we've done so far is take a look up at the current performance up to the start of September. Um, and actually what we're going to do now is have a look at how we expect the rest of the year to net out. Um, and just to caveat that actually some of our forecasts that we've got, some of our thoughts are based on um, just demand. And obviously we know that supply is vulnerable at the moment and might not be able to match some of that demand itself. So, what we do at AHDB, we do our agri-market outlook. The link is there on, on the slide. Um, and we do this every six months, forecasting um, in our team, the domestic demand, but also looking at production and trade and the other influences um, from other parts with, within the market intelligence division at AHDB. So when we think about um, domestic demand and where it might net out for the rest of the year, for the full year 2021, what we see is that we're expecting a flat performance for pork and for lamb and actually a small decline for beef, which has linked to some of that performance of mince that Rachel showed us a minute ago. 
versus 2019, we're actually seeing a slightly more positive picture. So still volumes up around 2% for um, beef and for pork, but actually a 4% increase forecasted for lamb, which is partly linked to some of those food service volumes. However, when it comes to 2022, our full year forecast is going to be more negative. Um, we're expecting slight declines of around 1% for beef, 3% for pork and 4% for lamb. And the key reason for this being around some of that more negative sentiment coming back in that we expect, but also we're already some in, starting to see some of those shoppers start to drop out anyway. Um, so we, we know that we've started to lose some of those shoppers and therefore the full year next year will be challenging. So the challenges for red meat in retail. So firstly, we've got meat free. Um, so the value gains for both meat and meat free have eased since the start of the year, but meat free continues to gain in volume terms. But this increase is, um, in meat free isn't necessarily linked to vegans because one in three baskets that contain vegetarian and vegan foods also contain meat. So next we've got return of the media. So COVID-19 dominated the news, which reduced reputational pressure on red meat production. Obviously, as COVID-19 now receives less attention in the media, this is providing an opportunity for more negative agricultural news stories relating to animal welfare standards, sustainability and the health credentials of red meat. But on the flip side, there is also more opportunity for positive news stories. And then finally, we've got price pressure. So as previously highlighted, 28% of households believe they are worse off financially since the pandemic. With shoppers feeling the pinch, they're likely to trade down, purchase more on promotion, or look to buy from cheaper stores and own brand product ranges. We saw previously also that some consumers are feeling better off. For those with greater spending power, we're likely to see spend move into the out of home sector or see some increase in the in home lunch occasion, as these people are more likely to continue to work from home, at least occasionally. So catering to such a broad spectrum of people also means it's very important to look at range and offering in retail. Um, when we look at that retail market, actually, what we're seeing in meat, fish and poultry is a trend that is mirrored um, across grocery, which is one where frequency of purchase is still down versus previous years and pre-pandemic. And actually, we're seeing still a slight increase in the amount that people are buying on each trip to the supermarket. Um, I guess one word of warning for meat, fish and poultry is actually that increase in trip volume that we see here in the blue line here isn't tracking as high above pre-pandemic levels as we would like and actually frequency of purchase is still um, down quite a lot. So there's quite a lot of, uh, to, of ground to make up here. And actually this is a trend that, that Cantal don't see returning sort of pre-pandemic levels anytime soon. So we've basically, we've got a smaller repertoire of shoppers we're visiting stores less often, which means that as an industry, there are fewer touch points to engage with the consumer. And what we see here on the right is some uh, research that we've done with Cantal showing that there's a large proportion of shoppers that just don't enjoy our really indifferent uh, to browsing the meat aisle when in their supermarkets. And actually this is our unconscious reducers, so people that are dropping a bit of their meat purchases and not even aware of it. When we look at what we've termed our conscious reducers, which are those who are actively following a meat reduction diet, which includes things uh, like vegetarians, flexitarians, but this increases to 82%. So a big proportion of people just not enjoying shopping the meat aisle. So we know that there's a real need to re-engage shoppers, um, both in store and online. And what we've done recently is hone in on that in-store environment and run a piece of research to look at how we can actually inspire our shoppers and get them to buy more beef, lamb and pork. So the findings from this research are uh, fully available on our website via that link on the slide there um, and it can be read in more detail. But just a really, really short synopsis of what we've found is that really we had a number of communication territories that we could have taken forward with our shoppers. But actually there were there were there was a real need for these communications to sort of interact. There wasn't going to be one silver bullet that worked 
to attract people into the aisle right through to making that purchase decision. So what we saw is that in terms of attracting people into the aisle, a theme of sort of inspiration, which is from giving people confidence in their cooking, giving them flavour inspiration, and really making them feel about, uh, think about the meal rather than just the meat, was going to really attract people into the aisle and get them to start thinking about uh, red meat. And um, all of this is around giving people that sort of confidence, as I mentioned. And then once they're in the aisle, we found that actually farming uh, messaging and sort of sustainability had more of a role to play. And particularly some of that messaging around UK farming expertise and some of the comparisons to the rest of the world that you'll see in our, our Eat Balance campaign around sort of the UK having lower carbon emissions than the rest of the world was a real interest to people. And we found that sort of disruptive point of sale, so things that sat on the shelf were working particularly well to educate and, and inspire shoppers. And then when it came to that final decision making purchase, um, this is where health was that final reassurance. And this was around those multiple benefits of red meat when it came to overall uh, vit vitamins and minerals. But actually vitamin B12 was going to be the hero here because we could provide a tangible consumer benefit uh, and get people actually making that final decision to put beef, lamb and pork in their baskets. So what we saw is that there is an opportunity to inspire our shoppers to get them buying a bit more red meat. Um, and what this is about is sort of around um, utilising this research from us at HDB, but also processors and retailers all working together to try and yeah, utilise this research to get more um, inspiration and ideas to the, to the uh, shopper. And we've already rolled this out with all the major processors and retailers. But if this is something that hasn't come your way and you're interested in, please do visit that link or drop us a message. Um, so that sets out the sort of opportunities that we've got here for retail. And now Rachel will cover off the food service. Thanks, Beck. So, yeah, um, the opportunities we see for food service going forward. So first of all, we've got innovation and experience. And we've seen that takeaways are becoming more every day, which means trips out are becoming more special. So when going out, it's likely to be more of a treat. So we know that queues like British or Chefs Recommended are linked to higher menu spend, so it could be used to boost quality credentials and help margins on premise. Innovation can also include broader themes that uh, Beck just touched on, such as sustainability, but they'll need to be recognisable and accessible on menu for the customer. And then additionally, within the innovation and experience category, the proportion of dishes tagged as customisable has more than doubled this summer at 33%, allowing flexibility for both operator and customer. Next, we've got presents. And this is about getting proteins on menus. Um, so menus are still 16% smaller than pre-pandemic, with menu sizes shrinking, uh, shrinking at food service venues and a broader selection of diets being catered for. It's even more of a challenge for red meat to remain relevant on menu. So if, an, a key example of this is of non-takeaway meals where the protein is specified, lamb takes just a 0.9% share of those meals. And this proportion actually edges down slightly each year, meaning it's being squeezed off the menu. And then on top of smaller menus, what we can see is that British cuisine, while still the most popular, is actually losing share to non-British. And therefore, red meat needs to be available in these other cuisine types. And then finally, we've got takeaways and food to go. Um, so total food service is only 80% of what it was in 2019, but food to go is predicted to see growth. And the key opportunities in food to go include suburban locations, snacking, at home lunches, and then also contactless drive throughs and value for money. And value for money is going to be particularly important for those harder off, as many will probably look um, more towards quick service restaurant value offerings as an affordable treat. And then finally, takeaways are seeing an expansion of occasion, such as the weekday lunch delivery at six percentage points, um, as well as Sundays, which have also taken an additional three percentage points of takeaway spend versus 2019.
And then health and sustainability are an opportunity for both retail and food service. So for health in retail, there's been increased scrutiny of red meat, therefore positive messaging is needed. And we've seen that the vitamins and mineral category has grown faster than average since the pandemic. Therefore, there's an opportunity in communicating the vitamin and mineral benefits around red meat. So Beck touched on this earlier. And um, for instance, vitamin B12 has a tangible benefit for consumers as it's proven to reduce tiredness and fatigue. And then in terms of food service, consumption of meat is more likely to be for a treat. But for calorie and nutritional um, labelling legislation will come into force, which could change consumer perception going forward. And then in terms of sustainability in retail, there's evidence that Britain versus the rest of the world resonates with the consumer. So we should be promoting the differences between British and the rest of the world. In food service, Operator and supplier relationship is key as more governmental intervention is uh, possible in the future. And therefore, it's really important to work together and know and measure our supply chains. And then to find out more on these topics, please sign up to our Consumer Landscape webinar, which is happening on the 25th of November. So, just to summarise the four key takeaway points uh, we'd like you to take away from this presentation. Uh, firstly, price and promotions. So lots of households are and will be negatively impacted by the pandemic. And therefore it's really important to have a broad range of price points and promotions to encourage the consumption of red meat in both retail and food service channels. Secondly, we've got reinvigorate. So as Beck mentioned earlier, Many shoppers don't enjoy shopping the meat aisle. Therefore, we need to improve the appeal of the meat aisle in store and online to engage shoppers with the meat category. Then we've got relevance. So the fight for space in retail and food service is getting tougher. Therefore, we need to innovate and inspire new occasions to maintain relevance. And this could be through flavor and product pairings, recipe ideas or new cut offerings. And then finally, we've got industry image. So broader industry themes such as health, welfare and sustainability are impacting the long term performance of red meat. Therefore, we should be promoting the positives. So AHDB's marketing campaign Eat Balanced actually aims to remind and reassure consumers of the role red meat and dairy can play in a balanced diet and the sustainability of livestock produced in Britain. So now I'll we'll hand back over to Kim. Hi, sorry, had some issues with my mouth there. Um, so thank you very much, um, Beck and Rachel, for that great presentation. A lot to cover in such a uh, short space of time, but fantastic insights for the industry. Um, before moving on to the Q&A, I just wanted to remind you all to sign up, if you haven't already, to the next set of webinars hosted by the team. So firstly, on the 4th of November, um, we look at the evolving market landscape for dairy, focusing again on demand and behaviour for um, different dairy products. And then, as already mentioned, on the 25th of November, we deep dive into important industry topics of consumer attitudes towards trust um, in the industry, health, provenance, the environment, animal welfare, exploring how those perceptions have evolved, um, but again, pulling out the opportunities and threats in each one of these areas. Um, the webinar sign up is available on our website and you can see the, like, the link to that here on, on the screen. Um, and also on there, you can sign up to our bi-monthly newsletter, uh, which informs you of what articles and reports have been released in the recent week. So you can keep up to date with, with the news from the team. And final reminder is just to fill in the feedback form at the end if you would like to receive a copy of the slides. Um, even if you don't, we'd really appreciate hearing your thoughts on our, on our work. So um, let's move on to some questions. Um, and just to flag, don't worry if we don't cover um, all of the questions, we will be answering them via email if we don't have time today. 
Um, so I have um, been looking at some of the questions that have been coming through um, as people, as um, Beck and Rachel have been talking, and there's been quite a few comments and questions about what could we be doing um, and I think that kind of links to the second half of the, the presentation which may have been covered um, after the, those uh, questions which really deep dives into the opportunity so um, the team mentioned things um, to do with the product so innovation um, inspiration um, but also the communication opportunities so um, the team mentioned the work that we've been doing on the in-store experience and how we can improve that um, but also uh, communication um, directly to consumers. So obviously the team mentioned the AHDB We Balanced campaign, which um, went back on air on the 6th of September um, to tie in with COP26. Uh, and also there's a burst in January as well um, to tie in uh, with the January. And there was also a good uh, comment about um, the consumer trust in farming being a really big opportunity that we should push in, as an industry. Um, and I completely agree with that. Um, and um, there is a, that, there'll be more on the trust in the industry in the conference on the 25th. Um, there was also a question about forecasts for 2022, and I believe the team um, had that on a slide after that question was, was put in, but please uh, email if you want any more information. Um, so I'll go to one which I'm going to pass on to Beck, actually. Um, so how will the HFSS restrictions affect red meat? Um, and which products are likely to benefit, do you think? Yeah, so um, Rachel mentioned that briefly, the HFSS changes uh, and the link to the obesity strategy. So um, one sort of positive thing that changed during the consultation phase was that obviously uh, processed, pig meat, uh, processed meat products in particular were going to be in scope of these regulations and during the consultation phase were not included um, so that's good news for now um, products that are included that will affect meat include sort of pizzas and ready meals um, and sort of some of those further manufactured products um, so anything that's sort of breaded or coated for example um, so there will be sort of no sort of volume driving promotions on these sorts of products but it does mean that they'll also get no um, uh, extra shelf space, so no gondola ends, no uh, extra areas outside of the, the existing chillers. So actually, there could be a bit of opportunity here for red meat in that some of that space on those gondola ends will be freed up from some of those products. Um, they will be vying for some of that space um, alongside other categories that are thinking the same thing, um, in particular sort of meat free as well. Um, but the whole thing in particular is likely to bring sort of a big sort of heightened focus on health, I would say, because obviously it's all targeted on the, the fat, salt and sugar content. So we could see sort of consumers becoming more aware about um, what they're consuming, think about it more, becoming more top of mind. Um, and so obviously we'll cover off sort of consumer perceptions of health and the livestock sectors in, in that webinar that you mentioned on the 25th of November. Um, and we do know that obviously it's not just retail that will be affected. Um, food service will also come under some regulations. So some of the larger food service operation of operators will have those regulations around menu and calorie labelling, which again is likely to heighten that focus on health of our consumers. And I think actually one thing is that it's all this is probably just the start of some of those interventions. So whilst it's sort of good news that things like the processed meat products aren't included now, um, like they potentially could have been think potentially further down the line, a few years down the line, actually they could come into scope. Um, and so it's really important over the next few years to trial things that don't don't require some of those volume driving promotions or some of that off shelf space like those gondola ends, um, which will affect categories, particularly like sort of bacon and sausages, which do utilize sort of your, your two for six, three for 10 examples um, that, that Rachel mentioned earlier of um, sort of in those volume driving motions. Great. Thank you very much, Beck. Really good answer. Um, we've got one coming for, for you, Rachel. Um, you mentioned household finances and economic pressure. Um, if consumers are feeling the economic pinch, will this affect um, certain types of uh, types of cuts purchased? Yeah, thank you. Um, so we can often think that everyone will respond in the same way, but consumers will actually react in different ways depending on their personal circumstances. 
So understanding what the consumer's need states are is very important. So for example, those under economic pressure may look to buy more on promotion, cheaper cuts or shop at cheaper stores. And this could see us move towards smaller primary cuts and drive sales of mints or processed meats like sausages and burgers, as well as like your frozen, uh, it could be frozen chicken breasts or it could just be any frozen meat in general. But then on the flip side of that, as households finances are impacted, consumers are actually likely to direct any cuts to spending towards out of home um, and eating out. So this provides opportunity for primary cuts, premium products and added value cuts in retail as consumers look to recreate those out of home meals in home for a treat. And additionally, we've seen previously that in times of economic downturn, consumers actually often indulge and treat themselves more. So as I just highlighted, it could be actually driving more towards the premium retail cuts as um, people are looking to treat themselves and replicate something uh, out of home, but at slightly less of a cost. Great, thank you very much, Rachel. Um, we'll link to price again, and actually, Beck, I might hand this over to you because I know you've written a, a recent article um, about uh, price inflation. Um, but what do you think the inflation pressures will be on red meat? Um, and will retailers keep them as loss leaders or pass increases on? Yeah, this is a tough one as to how much is going to be passed on. I think consumers are definitely being primed for price increases. Obviously, there's a lot being communicated, a lot in the media as well. Um, and this could actually, regardless of how much is passed on to consumers, it could still influence how their behaviours change. Um, so we could see that um, we've seen previously in times of um, economic downturn, as Rachel sort of mentioned there, is that people will start to buy more on deal or they'll start to trade down as well. So I, th I think regardless of sort of how much of those rising input costs are passed on to shoppers and consumers, actually we will start to see some of those behaviours start to change um, a little bit. And I think um, whilst we're seeing some of that demand rebounding as well, and um, particularly in the out-of-home market, it is still going to be really fragile. Um, and I think um, uh, Rachel showed that chart around sort of the consumer confidence in their household finances, but general consumer confidence dropped significantly in September linked to a lot of the media um, and the, the external pressures on, on consumers and on our supply chains as well. Um, so it is incredibly um, fragile. So I would say it's worth sort of playing into those past behaviours of um, increasing use of promotions and trade downs and utilising some of those those methods to continue to get them buying into, into the category. Great, thank you very much, Beck. We've had a question come in about, um, have you got any evidence that the current pig crisis is influencing consumer uh, purchases and opinions? Um, just to flag that we have um, added um, some uh, relevant questions to our consumer tracker, but haven't got any um, got any data in yet. Um, so this is something that we are going to be going to be looking at. So I would advise um, keeping an eye on our on our website for when we um, for when we publish something. Um, so I will move on to a question about food service. So Rachel, I might um, pass it on to you. It was more of a comment about. Um, the fact that you you said earlier on that um, cleanliness was a concern as to why people weren't eating out, yet um, many people are still using um, takeaway and delivery services and they don't kind of have any understanding of how clean those places are. So what do you believe um, takeaways are, are doing to kind of combat that versus versus eating out? Um, so I'd say like when you're going and eating out, you're obviously witnessing what people are doing in the actual retailer or the place you're eating. So you could see whether someone's actually wiping down the table before you sit down or who's handled the dishes or the cutlery or whatever that's coming your way. Whereas the takeaway industry, you're you're like a step back from that. So you're not seeing what's happening to the food before it gets to your door. And so it's more of a, um, a mindset in, 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 that you'd think, well, they've got 
um, precautions in place and they follow a set procedure to prevent this. Um, so it's more that you're slightly out of the loop, so you're not seeing what's happening and you're not there going, oh, well, actually, my cutlery's just been down on this table and I don't know whether it's been wiped or not. Like, you've taken all of that away. You've got your own cutlery at home that you can use. You can transfer it onto something that you know is clean, like a clean dish, whatever. So it's just you're slightly removed from the actual process. So those sort of um, opinions and worries aren't necessarily there. Yeah. Ignorance is bliss, I suppose. <laughs> and as a regular takeaway person, um, I do know that they are pushing a lot the whole contactless delivery if people are worried about um, interacting with other people. Um, and obviously one of the top things you said, Rachel, was about people not going out was actually they're just enjoying being at home. So takeaways are benefiting from the fact that people probably just would prefer to stay at home um, as well. So that's great, thank you. Um, I am gonna um, wrap up there and take any other um, questions um, over and we'll email people because I am conscious that we wanted to finish a couple of minutes before 11 o'clock in case people have other meetings and they want to go get a drink, etc. So I just want to say um, thank you very much to Rebecca and Rachel for the presentations today. And thank you very much to everyone who has attended as well um, and engaged in the, in the Q&A as well. We'll be in touch with everyone. And just a final reminder, um, there will be a feedback link that pops up now. If you could please complete that um, so that you are able to be sent the, the slides, that would be really appreciated. So thank you very much um, and goodbye, everyone. <laughs>